And yeah, I'm excited for this panel. Lots of uh, fun people, new friends, um, older friends, and uh, it's exciting to see things come together. So um, are you in a good spot with said laptop? I think so. Okay, amazing, perfect. Am I the old friend? Uh, I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, that doesn't mean you're old, it just means you know there's time passed. Sure. Uh, all right, so for the group here, we'll get this started. Um, we have Alex Porter, Tim, Timothy Porter, Trevor Burke, and Adam Pikowski uh, with your guys' talk. So I'll leave it off to you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, JT. Thank Woo. you. Yeah. Uh, I think we're starting with a little brief introduction of sure. each of us. So we'll oh, yeah. Go, go down the line. Sure. So I'm, uh, I'm Tim Porter. I'm the CTO at ModTech Labs. Uh, we do automated optimization and quality assurance, mostly for ICVFX and virtual production. My background, I spent split between games and movies and video games. I was a technical artist, and in movies, I was a pipeline technical director. So kind of bringing all of that full circle and trying to make the movie industry see the fun things that we saw in video games about 20 years ago. So like, how do we bring all that tech and all those wonderful tools right back around? Cool, and Adam? Uh, I'm Adam Bykowski, uh, the executive uh, director of technology at a studio called Dot Dot Dash. Um, my background uh, is in um, creative application of technology, um, a, a lot of interactives, permanent physical spaces, um, and very much uh, these days um, living in the virtual world and the digital. Um, Dot Dot Dash is an innovation studio. Um, we have offices in uh, Portland, New York, and LA, um, and we build things for commercial clients um, as well as uh, cultural institutions and um, artists. Alex. I'm Alex Porter. I'm CEO at ModTech Labs. You heard from Tim a little bit about sort of the overview of what we do, but you know, our real focus is how we empower creatives with tools that take some of the boring and redundant stuff out of your workflows, right? Nobody loves wrapping UVs, nobody loves mesh decimation, maybe you do, maybe you're glutton for punishment. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we believe that there are tools that can enable uh, much more productivity, much more satisfaction, and much more creativity. And so that's the world that we sit in. Uh, Mod is uh, almost four years old now. Um, we are a startup in the media tech space, which is a whole wide world of uh, interesting fun. Um, and prior to this, we had an XR studio for five years where we actually were doing a lot of augmented and virtual reality tools for businesses using, you know, Tim's background in games and movies and my background in 3D uh, from the interior design side. Uh, you know, we really have culminated a lot of different tool sets and capabilities and functions in a way that we think will help make the industry more effective. Very cool. And I'm Trevor Burke. I, uh, I run a creative design studio called Visual Noise Creative, and we spend a, a good amount of our time splitting between uh, new projects and new solutions creatively to kind of funky uh, and unusual uh, prompts, and then and a lot of the other time is spent uh, lighting, lighting design on large scale broadcast type projects, a handful of films. Uh, we do a lot of stuff in the uh, award show space, cr both on the creative and on the screen side. Um, kind of come from a theater and a lighting background, so kind of a, a bit of a creative mutt and use that uh, as much as I can to our advantage. Um, so I think the cool thing is, is we all have pretty different uh, backgrounds here, and so we're gonna we're gonna use a handful of questions to kind of get us into uh, into conversation. Um, so here we go. Like you're first up, Adam. <laughs> apparently, uh, some of our, off our uh, early stuff, and then we'll kind of draft off what each other are talking about. Cool. Um, thanks, Trevor. Um, so I'm going to turn around and read this question. Um, but you know, one of the questions that we get asked a lot is like, "What do you do?" Um, and that is seemingly an easy question, but for us, it is so hard to explain. Um, and, you know, for dot dot dash, and specifically for me personally, like, um, we're positioned as an innovation company, and innovation, in my mind, is kind of a dirty word. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything. It carries a lot of weight. People throw it around. Innovation labs, like, we are doing this because it's innovative. But, like, what does that really mean? Like, when you really boil it down, like, how do you um, go to a client or really, like, go to someone's grandmother and say, this is what I make? Um, like it's a dirty word because it's um, 
Because it's a buzz, like it's more buzzword than substance. It's abused. It's abused. Right. It's like, yeah. you know, people used to say, like, oh, we want story and synergy. But it's a, co- yeah, okay. <laughs> got, got it. Yeah. Buzz, yeah, like in a cor- buzzword. It's center. like corporate speaky. Yeah, okay. Um, but at the same time, it is like, it does carry weight, right? Like, um, we do want to be on the forefront of technology and we want to be doing things differently, which uh, there is like a practice to innovation and it is like a, a skill that you kind of like need to lean into and, and, and cultivate. Um, but it can, its outputs can be so varied, right? Like if you're like, I am a filmmaker, you make film. If you are a ceramicist, you make ceramics. Uh, if you're like, my medium is innovation, it's like, I do XR. I have done AR. I do large scale media architecture. It's like, you know, I build pipelines or I, you know, push forward design within the context of uh, performance. Like, it can really spread across a bunch of different things. And I think it's, it's kind of hard for us to, to communicate that. Um, yeah, I don't know. What, at one point, we had a business card that was, the back of it was literally just like all of the acronyms, right? AR, VR, MR, XR, IOT, AI, ML, IC, VFX, VP, and I call alphabet it alphabet soup. soup. I like the reality is, you know, we're all speaking in tongues at some point to people that don't necessarily intrinsically understand what all of these uh, things mean. And I think it is important to start in that place, like you're, t- you're talking to your grandmother, you're talking to a 10 year old, how can you actually convey these really complex, wonderful, beautiful technologies in a way that is approachable and in language that is uh, more simplified? And so I think that that's one of the things that we really uh, struggle with, to be honest, um, as an industry. How do we bring these to the other pieces and parts of the world and the people that are interested in them in a way that they can understand it the best? I think too is like, it's kind of hard because something that means uh, one thing in context A means something totally different in context B. Um, so like, let's take the word technical director, right? Like a, a technical director in uh, lighting is very different than a, a rigging TD or a te- technical director uh, in games. Um, and so a lot of what we do is like try and take that alphabet soup and like turn it into its lowest common denominator and say, okay, this is the thing that we are actually doing and then bridge those gaps um, as far as when we talk so about So yeah, you like almost have to remove preconceived, you like there's almost a, a level of defining at every step of the word to like rebuild a common vocabulary. Mm-hmm. I mean, right? interdependent like, liaison is extremely important. That's something that we saw a lot in video games and we're starting to see slowly come over as a technical artist that was one of my major jobs. Um, so learning more and more the different speak between different teams is extremely important, but then as well being able to talk to your clients and do the dissemination, knowing what part of what industry. So our previous company, which was under Minor Studios, we would go between different corporations. So we would do something at like Novartis, or we'd do something with Microsoft or Intel, and every single one of the groups does have a different speak. Um, so if anybody's not in standards organizations, it actually helps being able to understand what different industries and what different groups within different industries are speaking about. But yeah, I mean, everything's kind of ethereal until you actually figure out what that individual's brain and speak is. Um, communication is, is so limited, just in general. Visuals always help. Yeah, I mean, I guess where else, because it is so, I keep timing out, but like where, <laughs> where does that, like where does that fall, I guess, in everyone's workflow, like that portion of it, like where in the hierarchy and where in the conversations, because it is like, you know, I find like, often as a creative producer, when I'm doing something new with new people, there's like, okay, there's a context of like, well, that's a rock and roll person, so his view of a stage manager is different than that person over there who came from theater, who's that different from that guy over there who comes from broadcast. Like, I have to know those. Mm -hmm. And then, so is it like, like, where does it, where does that fall in your guys' like ecosystem to like, like, is it your job to decode it? Or like, are you, how are you pointing it out? Or are you relaying back to your teams like what all these different, like what that means when someone says, oh yeah, we need a stage manager. I mean, reduction in conversation is always helpful. Having some person who is you know, head of communication or handles at least that communication does reduce the number of issues that you have. You find somebody who's extremely skilled in the translation between different people and different groups. 
Um, and then it also allows for when you're somebody who's either on set or on, on the other side that's not part of your team to go, oh, this is my communication person. Uh, you know, if I need anything, I go to this person and, and then things get handled in a much sl smoother and s quicker fashion. But it's a communication loop. It happens throughout the entire process. Uh, one of the big things that helped our company and has continued to help us is uh, sitting down and doing discovery sessions. So that way you can understand what think that each one of the different teams has and then how important certain things are. Because in the end, all we're creating is magic. Where do we have people look? And then where do we put in, uh, energy or information in? Uh, you know, why would you spend so much time on a background asset when the foreground asset is what's important? Maybe for the client that actually is the most important view for them. Uh, but in the end, if you start those communications early, you make sure that you actually control the flow of the narrative, uh, and you do that throughout the entire process, it becomes a much more streamlined and slick solution for everybody involved, and people get uh, exactly what they're looking for out of a situation because they know the person that they're talking to and what the expectations are. I think something that you said is so important, but also like so hard to sell to clients is the <laughs> discovery phase, right? Or like yep. a discovery process. And part of that is, you know, uh, I feel like when you're embarking on a journey, like you're going to pack before you go on that journey, right? Like this is like the packing. Um, it's defining shared vocabulary. Um, and getting into a room and like really just like, you know, it would take you a month over email to figure it out. But right. if you're sitting there and you have like a, Sit eight, a table for eight hour immersion session, yeah. like really getting into it, you're like, oh, like I see what you're saying. That's not what you're actually saying um, or, you know, whatever. Um, and so part of what we try and do is like implement that into our process from the get go. And it actually just becomes part of the creative process. It's not right. its own discovery, but it's really like, the way that our creative process gets like moving and starts moving towards production. Yeah, we'll find ourselves even doing that, like, w super willingly even before like full engagement has happened because it's just so much e like it's impossible to define. And I guess this kind of parlays a little bit into the into the second question. It becomes like so hard to define where we're going and what we're trying to do. So you know, a first conversation is like, you know. Who do you who do you who's on the other end of the phone think you're talking to? Like, what do you see that you what do you see in us? And then conversations about it and it's like, hey, we're we're wet, we're we're here to spin and spool for a little bit until we kind of find collective footing and figure out like what the what the arc is. Is at least the way like we tend to to handle it. But like, what about your guys' projects? Like, how, like is it a defined phase or is it a like after signature or where does that fall? So for us, we decided to separate it into a separate phase. Um, it was a, it's a paid phase with a value added deliverable. So we do a discovery session, it's a paid session, it's in person, we have that feedback, we have those you know, definitions that we can create together, we can clarify what innovation is, what the goals are for the project overall because it's not always the thing that they have in their head that is what they actually need to solve their problem, right? Um, and so ultimately, for us, breaking it into uh, this session allowed us to do what we called a technical strategy plan is what we would deliver to them after the fact. This was also a great opportunity for us to screen clients because you do not always want to work with every client, right? Um, I'm sure we've all had those, those fun times where we're like, oh, that, that was a really hard, hard won battle. Um, so ultimately, you know, for us, it was a good opportunity to make sure that we were providing value but also being provided value for our time, energy, effort, knowledge, experience, right? Because those things are not free. <laughs> as much as we have them and we can give them for free, the reality, and people will take them for free, the reality is, you know, education can only go so far to pay our bills. <laughs> I want to educate every client and every person in the world about all these wonderful things. Um, but that was a really defining moment for our business, and it allowed us to really um, hone in on how we could be effective with clients and give them something that they could tangibly use with or without us. They could take the technical strategy plan and actually deploy it with someone else that was developing the product or potentially use use that internally or use that externally. So maybe they were a smaller company, they didn't necessarily have the funding they needed yet, but they needed something concrete to take to an investor. So our goal was always to figure out how they could use this as a tool in their tool belt to execute their plan and reach their goal. 
What about you guys, Adam? Yeah. I think it's like pretty interesting because you know you're describing it as uh, a deliverable. These are like deliverable based yeah. things, right? Like they come out of it and they've got like a plan, yeah. or they have you know some sort of um, document that allows them to move into the next phase. And Trevor, for you, is probably right. Like there's uh, there's there's tangible uh, actionable items that come out of it. Um, I think for us sometimes uh, the discovery actually is just like a synthesis of their of like what's going on in their mind. So it's like less actionable and it's just like, hey, here's a brief. This is like, yeah. you know, especially when working with some on the, specifically on the two ends of the spectrum, right? When you're working with like real creatives who don't create in a specific medium and but they have like this vision for what it is that they want to make. Um, just getting to what the core of that vision is and being like, you're telling me you want a red apple. And we're like, yes, the red apple, that's it. It's right. like so hard to do and that's like an oversimplification. But then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, like you guys are a software product uh, and like explain to people what a software product is or like what the product is, how it what it does and like how it can be beneficial before yeah. implementing it, I imagine is equally as big of a challenge uh, because you know, you have no idea what's going on in their production pipelines or anything like that. I mean, I think our, our experience is probably similar to yours in the sense that, like, I feel like, you know, d A, it doesn't usually have def defined boundaries, and B, it's less a set of deliverables or an action plan, it's more just zero. Like, we're just trying to get to the start. Like, we're, we're, like, we're all just at different starting lines, and, like, it's successful if we're like, okay, we're at least on the same starting line now is kind of like, I know what you want, I know when you say big, it means that or that or an audience or whatever it may be, so it's that shared vocabulary, yeah. yeah we, we would start with that and that would be, uh, we typically split it up between two days and then the first day would be, let's start thinking about you know what our vocabulary is, let's start understanding each other and what expectations are when you say big. I know what big means, of course. Um, and then we would end up having a second day, and the second day was about breaking down what the end goal for the product was or project. Um, and so in the end, it was always on two different ways. Number one, it was either based off of time deliverable or it's based off of the amount of funding that the individual group has. Um, you, know, it's, you can work it backwards, that way you can say these are the features and these are parts that will end up being created, and you can look at it in a very analytical kind of function. Um, and so for us, the deliverable was taking to the end point what they were actually looking to get out of it and what they needed by what time period. So then we would actually give them Jira tasks and break it down and go, here's, you know, overarching, these are the ideas, this is the parts and pieces, and then they could take that off to a development team if they wanted to. Should we see what's on the next slide? <laughs> yes. Definitely. Do it. <laughs> Oh, another one for Adam. But I think we're like all I think they're like all maybe in order. <laughs> yeah, so just you like no, no, I think this is a little bit. Talking we can. One, but I think this is cool because I think this is an interesting question that I think breaks down differently across like the three different and it kind of starts to play around with that. But you know, how do you respond to a project brief requiring use of a particular technology? Because I think this found its way into this deck because I like kind of had a gag reflex to it. It was like, no, you need to have a creative alpha. And you're like, actually, <laughs> like, you know, like it's like, so. It, it goes back to that question of like, what is innovation? And like, um, for some people, innovation is creative ideas and other people, it's process. And some people just want to use a technology because it's cool, right? Like we're seeing that, uh, we saw that with Web3 and the metaverse and blockchain, like it was so, FOMO. so <laughs> hot, right? <laughs> Uh, and now it's like AI. Yeah. When was the last time you were in a creative conversation with a client where they like didn't mention AI this or AI that? Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that some people come at it from wanting to use a specific tool or technology. And there are, we have like some really interesting ways that we go about doing that. Um, and uh, if a project wants to use a technology, the first thing to do is like, do they actually know what technology they're asking for? Uh, and if the answer to that is yes, they're like very educated and they're like, this is what we want, we're like, cool, we will absolutely structure this and build you something amazing with it. Um, and then we'll sort of post-rationalize, not post-rationalize, but we'll uh, figure out a creative idea that fits into that to, to showcase that technology in the best way possible. Like we do that all the time. It's like, you know, you see that on trade show floors um, uh, in, you know, um, infrastructure, 
uh, companies wanting to explain what they do and what their product does. Um, there's like this distillation of really complex ideas into tangible um, or simple things that people can understand. Uh, but then I think the second side of it is like, how do you just, if, if people don't necessarily know what the technology is, like how do you um, give the space for exploration uh, to like show what, what, that, what it could possibly be? And I feel like that's when it gets into, you know, prototyping and making really, really quickly um, and providing some constraints to make within. Um, and that's honestly like one of my favorite places to play when there's like a new technology that's coming out or a product that someone wants to use and it's like, okay, cool, like let's, let's build a framework to build you the coolest AR spatial audio demo that has generative AI human input into it. And we're like, cool, we can figure that out. For us, we sit in an interesting space, right? As a software product, um, we use AI uh, in the background, right? So I'm like, we're that AI, not that AI. Um, I actually have had this conversation a bunch of times, and I was on a panel uh, recently um, in Buffalo, where we're from, and I had someone else talking about um, ways that AI is being used in movies, so replacing extras, right? And I was like, we don't do, she's like, like Alex's company, I was like, we don't do that. <laughs> um, and then she was talking about backgrounds, and I was like, we do that. I was like, we do virtual backgrounds. Um, and so it really is, it really is a matter of of um, understanding how to be effective with the use of these innovative tools, right? Where is it actually a value add, whether that is like a brand recognition, hey, we're a brand, we're engaging with this new technology, and that's important to us, we wanna be on the forefront of this adoption, right? That's one way, or it could just be like, this is a really meaningful business opportunity that will help us be more productive and more effective, and we sit a bit more on that side. I don't think that we've had a lot of uh, clients come to us um, in this company um, as a software solution saying, we want to use AI, you have AI. That's, that's not where we sit currently. But it's definitely like, you're doing automation and you're making tasks faster and you're making people that work with us more effective, that's a value add for us. And so we see a little bit more on uh, the benefit side rather than sort of like the functionality side, the feature side. Um, but that's just, that's this world that we're in today. I guess like a question for like related to that is, do you find it beneficial to say that yes, we're using AI in the background? Is it like even important? I mean, to the creative process as well, right? Like, yeah. is it like, yeah, we use Photoshop. Like Photoshop is great. Exactly. No, it's like it's like being excited about like, oh, this was a table saw. It's like mm, that's a beautiful table. Like, like, I mean, I think like, like the I think the interesting like kind of rounding out like the three different perspectives on this is, you know, like I where we come from often when people come with you know this is a tech that I want to use. I, like it's kind of like you know reading the stage directions the first time you read a play you're like I'm gonna ignore those because I'm gonna make up my own like yeah. when I'm gonna do it and so it is interesting like to hear the difference in it because from like where I sit it's like I try and think about it more about backing into like like what do they think that this makes them feel what do they think this makes the guest feel what does this impact the experience and like you know for me the one I like always like anecdotally use was when, you know, interactive installations were like the buzz of whenever it was. And you'd have creative meeting after creative meeting where you have, you know, a reference deck and someone all excited about this interactive installation. And the, the, the point that it goes like, well, okay, like that's a beautiful thing in a museum where eight people a day can see it. But like where we we're putting this on a trade show floor, where you like it's anything short of you know eight thousand is unsuccessful. So like let's back into what that like we don't I don't get this touchy feely with people, but it's like you're thinking about it in the sense of like what is that end user experience and what is that like emotional and creative response to the prompt, and then how do you create that in the experience and in the environment that you're participating in and then it'd be like that's when you get into it it's like you know you I did an electrical parade where the idea was like we'll have guests be able to control the color of the parade float and it's like well there's 18,000 people on the parade route like how are they gonna know like how like how, like there is no cause and effect there's no emotional connection but what is the feeling that you want to get out of it and that's something that's a little dangerous for us uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword we do want people to be excited about AI uh, we do have also perceptual quality control. So as we do optimization, we make sure that 
perceptually through an artificial intelligence engine that we build, it's a convolution, whatever, um, and go all the way down the deep, um, that it maintains quality. But at the same time, we also have to continue to speak that it's not going to replace somebody. Uh, its entire thing is a safety net. It is a speed up solution. It is how you get the dollar and cents to actually come across. How do you make a stage profitable? Uh, and that's how we try to help. Uh, but once again, you still have to have them feel, go, oh, you're optimizing, you're reducing my quality, but, and then that's where the heartfelt comes in. We are also maintaining it by keeping the quality high, but not so deep that they feel like they're losing their jobs. How do you do that? The other, Balance. the other piece I'll briefly add to that is that, you know, definitely different, you know, sort of sales processes. It is important for us to talk about like the undercarriage, if you will, like what technology we're using, how we're using it, because we typically have three types of uh, buyers that are involved in a purchase decision for our software, right? We have a technical person who's like a VAD, VFX, like somebody who's in charge of like the technical implementation, right? We have a producer who's in charge of your budgets and your you know team, making sure everyone's happy with what's happening. And then we have likely an executive who's like, oh, we're making an infrastructure change or an addition that will potentially change other things in our workflow. And that typically, has some sort of buy-in as well. And so for us, like for those technical buyers, we absolutely have deep down conversations about what types of technology we're using, how they're being implemented, what they're displacing or replacing or augmenting because it is very nuanced and specific um, and important because they wanna know all of those details. The other two don't wanna know all those details, <laughs> definitely. Um, and it is sometimes it's kind of you know splitting hairs to figure out exactly how deep people want to go, mm -hmm. right? because I'm sure you guys have experienced that as well. Like you have some people that come to you and they're like, I just want to know all of the like, all of the nitty gritty. Um, and other people are just like, just show me the magic. <laughs> the, some people don't want to know how the sausage is made. <laughs> Heard that. <laughs> yeah, it's like context is so key. Yeah. Yep. Um, and what context are you providing to who? Uh, at what point in time? <laughs> you know, no easy task. Here we go. Uh, what is your approach to building trust with a new client, especially one having difficult defining what they want to achieve? Well, I think we can probably all get into this one a little bit. I mean, I like taking someone out for drinks. That's yeah. Like that's like a good first step, yeah. maybe an introduction first. Um, no, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really important question. It's a really hard question, too, um, especially, especially when they're pushing into new territory, um, which is, I think, you know, a commonality between what we all do up here um, is either trying to realize an idea or uh, improve upon a process or build something that hasn't, be built, hasn't been built before. Um, it requires such a level of trust. Um, I mean, one thing that speaks for itself to some degree is some of the work that you've done in the past, right? Like that's always, I find super helpful, um, especially if it's, relevant and tangential to like what it is that they're trying to do. It's like close, but not the exact same. They're like, okay, it's close enough that I can like bridge that gap and make that jump in my mind. Um, but I don't know, I think, I think it's, uh, trust doesn't just like happen. It, it takes time um, and people wanna move fast, especially these days. They're like, we want something yesterday. Um, and uh, establishing that trust usually, uh, for us at least, um, we do have a lot of repeat people that we work with, both you know, uh, staff that we work with and partners that we work with regularly, as well as clients. And it's because that trust is sort of built over a long period of time. <laughs> for me, actually, uh, before I, I got into the industry, actually, I sold cars for a living. And so something that was taught to me was, because uh, I actually sold Toyotas, uh, there were three different things that buyers were coming in for. They were either coming in for performance, safety, or price. Um, and that has actually led me to be able to go ahead and help define and how you do communication uh, with certain clients and making sure that you can actually get trust. Um, limiting the amount of solutions or decisions that they can go towards tends to lend themselves to feeling like they're driving the decision, they're helping you drive the decision, but at the same time, you're also limiting it towards what your skills, capabilities, and what your team is going to be able to do. Um, so something has worked fairly well for me is as you're coming into a new communication, you end up having a couple of different solutions. Go back and lean on previous projects that you've had and go, 
which one of these looks like what you're interested in, and then let's talk about the specifics and particulars and the things that you like, the sugar that you want on top of it, and then how do we go ahead and add that to make it something that's amazing and beautiful and all your own. Um, but it's on my end, obviously, because I come from a more technical side of things, I have to make it work. Uh, it comes from a much more driven decision and how you can drive the conversation to bring people into trusting you and then as well understanding that things are are competent and capable. So for me, I'm the person they need to trust in that it will happen and that we'll find a solution for them. So. I, think it, I think it boils down to show, show not tell. Um, there are a lot of people that say a lot of things, but whether it is, you know, prior work, whether it is, you know, partnerships, whether it is, you know, existing clients that can do referrals for you, that sort of thing. I think that there's a lot of tangibility in, um, you know, building those relationships over time, but also plugging into relationships that they already have existing. Um, for us, as this company is almost four years old, relatively fresh in the span of companies, um, you know, a lot of what we learned running a service-based business is that partnerships were really key for us. One of the reasons that we got a lot, we actually had a lot of inbound coming because we had a partnership with uh, Intel. We were part of their innovation program. And because they did featured stories on us and we were able to sort of um, create this opportunity, there was this knowing that people had because we were associated with them in a deeply technical manner that helped them understand that we were you know, already sort of pre-vetted, if you will. And so I think that there's a lot to be said about establishing trusted connections with well-known people in the industry, whether that is, you know, advisory, mentorship, partnership, um, clients, et cetera, um, or, or people that you hire internally. I think that's really important. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest, like it is the hardest part, I think especially where we sit usually is, you know, because you kind of have to get through a couple, you have to get through basic rapport. Then you also have to understand, like it's less about, for for me, like when you're dealing with someone, like less about understanding how they're articulating what they want to do, but more understanding the landscape of what they're trying, like, you know, they will often try and, again, it's not dissimilar to like coming in, prescribing it, to, like I want to use something interactive. It's like, you know, I think I want to, you know, and again, we don't have a shared vocabulary now, so when whatever they call what they want doesn't necessarily mean anything until we get through that basic rapport. And then from there, then it becomes about trying to understand and somewhat be a chameleon inside of what you're hearing and what, like in the way you can be the harmonious counterpart to that or the solution to it. So looking at like, and it depends on what it is, but often it's like, you know, we find ourselves, you know, once you've kind of figured out, it's like, okay, great. You face that way and I'll face this way and we'll go back to back and we'll support each other in that way. I don't need you, like we don't need each other to both be like facing the same direction. It's kind of, you know, the, the esoteric way to think about it. Do you guys, you said the word counterpoint, which actually like brought a thought to my mind, but do you guys ever find that it's actually uh, a, a fast path to trust by saying no sometimes? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Like 100%. Right? Like sometimes everyone wants to say yes to everything. They like want to be yes people because you like never want to shut an idea down. But sometimes actually I've found that if you say no but or no and this is why and it comes from like a place of experience that has a much faster track to yeah, sort totally. of establishing like, credibility. It's the, yeah, it's that, yeah, you're not dismissing and it's similar mm -hmm. to like the interactive ideas. Like, you know, y no, that's not what you actually want. But I think what you're saying is, or, you know, no, that's not gonna achieve the goals that you're looking for. Or, no, that's a scary idea and it's like unsupportable or that doesn't, you know, physics doesn't help that. But but once you, <laughs> but like, but it's not just like you're stupid and I'm going to yeah. shut it down. It's like, yeah. let's, let's, but let's come at the problem differently okay. is what it is like an opportunity to like actually, it's way more of an opportunity than just like, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. yeah. It goes back to driving that decision process. You want them to feel like they have ownership, but at the same time, you know, like you said, we all have to cover physics. Like people fall. Like this yeah. Is how it works. <laughs> to don't. Alex. All right. How do you balance project speed versus time for innovation? Uh, so, I mean, one of the things we sit very much uh, on the bleeding edge, if you will, 
um, right in that, that dirty word of innovation. <laughs> it keeps um, coming up. Exactly. I like, um, we, have, we have been in that space um, on sort of the, the precipice, the cusp of industries uh, for the last eight years. So this, I mentioned already, we had five years at a, as our XR studio, and this year, this one's almost uh, four years old. The, the reality is, like, we have been um, innovating and hammering on solutions in novel ways for a long time. Um, and there are a lot of interesting trends that you can see sort of happening over time, right? You, you think like Gartner hype cycle, that sort of thing. Those things are legit. That happens. There's peaks, there's valleys, um, there's opportunities, and there's also really great ways to say no. Um, but speed and innovation don't always match. <laughs> um, we're, we've actually uh, experienced this semi-recently in um, one of the new tools that we're in the process of finalizing, which is an Unreal plugin for virtual production. Um, there are, you know, a lot of, we have great ideas, great execution. The reality is, as much as you pre-plan, as much as you process these sort of things, it doesn't always match the timelines and the expectations. We have a different set of problems. We have our stakeholders at this juncture, you know, uh, the people that are waiting for this plugin are not currently paying customers, right? They're gonna be pay. we're in the process of moving them toward that goal, working together with them. But we have, you know, our investors who are, you know, saying, hey, what's going on? What's happening with the new product? That's, you know, so we don't have um, project timelines that are the same as a service-based business. Um, we're on our own sort of internal um, innovation track, if you will. That being said, no company can exist um, without generating revenue and without you know pushing forward and moving forward in that process and that cycle. And so it's a very different world that we sit in um, versus project-based work. Uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunity uh, to learn from project-based work and bring those processes of planning and production and execution into um, a more product-based business uh, versus service. Uh, but I think that there's also, a, it's hard. It's hard to reconcile that. What, what do you see those virtues as? Because like, you know, from our side of it, like there's, like we barely, like, it's all timelines. All it's time like, lines. and then we don't know how to think otherwise. So it's just, I'm curious, like what are some of those that, have virtue and like I guess vice versa because you because your guys's projects probably sit on the edge of all, both of them right both directions so like well, almost always have like a hard end date though or like a we need this by yeah. end right date, yeah you know? versus like you guys are yeah. like that's the terrifying thing in software right like it's never gonna it's be never done, done right exactly. so yeah. Consistent so product innovation. <laughs> always, always. And, and for us, I try to stay as much as we can in, you know, what we would do is here's a deadline, here's a timeline, let's work it backwards. How much time that we need, what are your ABCs? Uh, and so that's why I always tell uh, all of our employees, like, you know, this is your men spec, this is what we're gonna hit, this is what our, our actual deliverable actually really needs to be, and then here's a B thing, okay, that would be nice to have, you know, it's a wonderful feature, it'd be great, and here's C. Let's start dropping the Cs when we hit this timeline, let's start dropping the Bs once we hit this timeline, and then, you know, that's how you end up hitting a deadline. But uh, once again, once you're literally living in the world of innovation, um, not always do all the products and artificial intelligence engines and everything in between want to play the way that you want to, and then you end up having to beg, borrow, and steal from your investors. Please let us have more time, <laughs> because the dream never ends. I mean, I would love to know from both of you how it works on your end, right? You, you're you have very deadline-oriented work. Um, you know, how do you navigate innovation versus deadlines? I think it's like. So in software development, right, there's like agile development methodology, which is like sprint planning. You're like, all right, we've got two weeks. We're gonna try and accomplish you know, this thing in two weeks. Let's say we get half of the way, that then moves to the next sprint, and then you reevaluate. And so you're consistently sort of like updating timelines. Um, that works in product, which is probably how you guys work. Yep. There's also, or like, you know, most, like it's product development. Then there's like waterfall, which is like, hey, we need to get to this whole list of things by this date. Also, very hard to do. Um, and when you, like, we take a what we call a hybrid approach to this um, in order to hit, like, an MVP or minimum viable product. So um, we work in sprints, constantly reevaluating where we are, what we're building, how we're doing it. 
Um, but we do have a target at the very end, and that target is usually an MVP, which is all the feature, all the things that we need to get in no matter what, and if we need to staff up or change paths or whatever in order to hit that MVP, we will. Um, but then there's also the fun stuff, which is like the stretch goals. Um, and let's say you're like ahead of your timeline and cruising, and you're like, we're actually gonna make this do breathe fire right now, because why not, we can. Um, and it's like, that's when it gets really fun too, but I think it's, it's like in, kind of an idealized production practice that takes some of the best things from all of them, but it does require this like constant shepherding of the project along. And it's interesting because we've actually applied a relatively similar methodology, like you know whether the creatives realize it or not to the way that we run our creative process too. Um, and it's nice because all of the teams, we, you know, we have very uh, multidisciplinary sort of uh, cross-functional teams um, and they're all working in the same sort of iterative cycle, which allows us to get into like a really nice flow uh, for deliveries moving back and forth. Um, and that's, I think, once, once the team gets into a flow, that's where you really start to see things push and like, uh, like really pushing on the innovation and really pushing on what's new. Um, and that's like on a project level, but then you go like one level up and you're like, okay, like on a practice level as a whole or on a studio level as a whole, um, what, what things are you identifying um, as, you know, you talked about like Gartner hype cycles um, and, you know, we look at uh, tentpole events each year and we're like, okay, like what are the things that come out of those events or product announcements that we like want to slot in on a calendar and be like, hey, we're going to start to like play with these things now um, and not have them on a project, but like be thinking about it much larger to the point when we're like, all right, we've got to hit go on... AI this or metaverse that, we're like, cool, we already like know how to do this to some degree. Yeah. Um, and then it makes it much uh, more practical to put into a situation that has a firm deadline. Um, so that's then you can also show it to clients as well. Be like, hey, look, we actually did some R&D here. Isn't that cool? You know, and it leads to credibility. Totally. And it's like, I mean, the tricky thing is it requires investment to do the R and D, and where is that coming from, and like how you're going to do it. It's either now or later. An effort, you know. An effort, right? Like that's the terrifying yeah. part to like me, because you know, like we never have to think about deadline. We have to. We never have to think about the finish line is like unequivocal, right? So the thing that we have to figure out, like from the jump, is what the what the value system is specifically related to time, right? Is like you know, a, a kickoff phone call is like we want to do. Buzzword, buzzword, keyword. Wow, that's a bit. That's ambitious. Like By second, second question. Yeah. Well, the second question is, what's the time scale? Timeline. And like the like, it doesn't have to be necessarily off-putting, but it's like if this is a three-year project, we're looking at a whole different set of toolkits than if it's a eight-month project or three weeks, right? And it's the same thing as like, and it's the same thing as those like discovery sessions when you're when you're sniffing out what the common vocabulary is and what the common like workflow is when you figure out is like, okay, uh, you want buzzword, buzzword, keyword, and you want it in a shorter time frame. that ergo, like, okay, all that stuff's gone. We're using, now we're, now we're using money and we're using, you know, horsepower to like, to do that because that's, uh, that's the ingredient that other people don't have access to. It's the golden triangle, right? Money, time, quality. What are the two that you want? Pick two. You cannot have all three. Yeah, but I like I think yeah, we all came from that at a certain point, but at the other point, like the empowering thing is is like how do you hyper leverage them for yourself, right? When it's not a limiting factor, but it's like, all right, well let's go. But then, you know, the other part of it is because we tend to be less like driving ourselves in downtime, it's project to project to project. Like the time spent in between is really just like it's like a fighter getting ready like at the gym, right? Like all we're trying to do is like okay, the next time we do that, how do we do it faster? How do we, how are we more responsive? Not like we're not like we're we're building systems that can like come back in, be deployed again, but it's less like I don't know, like it's less self motivated like than what you guys are describing. I think like also too like the promise of a lot of the current tools coming out and current workflows coming out are to deliver on the golden triangle, right? Mm -hmm. It is like better, faster, cheaper, um, which is kind of interesting, but it it takes time. And the thing, one of the things that we've been seeing a lot or I've been seeing a lot lately is like the the things that are, that are, are actually 
maybe not slowing things down, but the the largest sort of barriers are actually process related um, in terms right. of like how things, who needs to approve this, and like who is the decision maker there, and um, we are, where are we getting the staff? It's like not doing the thing. Now you're saying your process or like client process or both? Because oh, yeah, like like, like, like we find like yeah. like client process is the hardest thing to manage. Like, you know, by ourselves yeah. in a vacuum, like, we can do stuff pretty fast. But like you know, once learning you know what all stakeholders and approvals and who gets a vote, which is its own set of figuring out, like that can like get in the way. Partnering with another company or partnering with another group or bringing in new individuals, like all of it takes, all, like the process on in general, like as a whole, uh, tends to be, you know, the biggest barrier to speed. Do we want to open it up for q and I yeah. think we have yeah. time yeah. for like a couple of yeah. I'm, I'm hovering, uh, but I'm you guys have oh. some time. It's okay. Uh, but yeah, if you guys are cool for questions, it'd be great Let's to do it. You know, yeah. for anyone. Um, we have a couple mics here. Any takers? Well, we can no? keep talking. You just want to hear us waxing poetic up here. Or leave, yeah. <laughs> I, I have one, because I'm annoying. Uh, <laughs> whether it comes to developing tech or like, oops, or executing it. Sorry, Madonna Mike in the way. Um, when it comes to like developing tech or executing on set, like you talked about this a bit, Alex, on your side, but when you're executing both, I think that becomes a really interesting conversation. And Trevor, you've, you've all dealt with that in so many different ways of like, yeah. Hey, we're not doing this as a business model. We just have this show in two weeks, and there's something brand new that's ever happened before. Like, is there anything super specific in that side where some of the, your normal guards that you put up about business or execution like kind of change? Like when you're on that bleeding edge, sometimes are, is there a moment for you all where you're like, we're on this train now? You know, we we totally put NFTs in our pipeline. <laughs> um, it was brief. Um, it didn't it didn't go quite the way that we thought it would. Um, in the, in let me clarify what I mean. Um, so we had a bigger, broader workflow for 3D um, asset generation and delivery. And so at the end of the pipeline, you could opt into having it um, and, you know, uh, minted on uh, Palm IO and have it delivered um, pre nft right? Um, we did the work, we added it into the pipeline, and then very shortly thereafter, that became um, a, a- Uncool. Yeah, uncool. That's what we'll less, say. Less um, cool. I still think there's. I still think there's a lot of functionality. Smart um, contracts are good, ish. Smart. Co <laughs> I'm about. like. I still think there's a lot of functionality, but the reality is, you know, that sort of like uh, that boom and bust happened relatively quickly when we were moving sort of into that space. That space was always tangential to like where we were at anyway, with content, you know. Um, but w absolutely, we have done that, and I think in general you have to evaluate what lift versus ROI, right? Um, which is challenging. It's always challenging. There's always there's no lack of things that we have on our to do list, and so we really are trying every day to be better at how we manage our resources and how we effectively deploy them in a way that's meaningful for our company and meaningful for our clients. And so we do also typically run on like a rule of three. So if we have three clients that are asking us for something specific, that's when we start figuring out like how we can move it up in the roadmap of development because it's really important to us to be listening and be aware of what's happening around us. We didn't we don't want to build in a bubble. We want to build in a way that's really helpful and meaningful for the people actually using our software. But we also move at the speed of money. Speed of money. <laughs> I don't know, JT, I think that's like a really good question. Like when do you pull some of the guardrails uh, for doing something innovative or something different? Um, and it's it's not a, it's never a one size fits all, uh, but it almost, not every, but almost a lot of the productions uh, that, that you end up being super proud of, you've, you've adapted in some way to do something that you didn't really want to do, uh, or you had to do it in a different way than you wanted to do it because there's, you know, uh, the right, and I'm putting that in air quotes because it's, there's a right way to do something, um, but then there's also the way that you practically need to do it in order to get it done for your client in that amount of time. Um, and I think the more that you do something repeatedly uh, or a specific project typology repeatedly, you learn what those things that you can maybe skirt around the edges. If you're especially, you know, I would say 70% of the stuff that we build is ephemeral, meaning it's up for a period of time and then it goes away. 
uh, the way that you build ephemeral activation versus the way that you build permanent activation is totally different. Like my background, I got started in permanent infrastructure for like museums and uh, you know Empire State Building. Like what we built for the Empire State Building, way way different. Like you know the amount of engineering, the amount of hardware, the qual like not quality isn't even the right word because it's just different than what you would build for like a pop up store or like an activation that's going to be up for two weeks. Um, and I think. You know, having experience in both of those realms, um, it is really about choosing the right tool for the right job. Like, do you need to build it from scratch? Is there something that exists that you can sort of wrap within something else? Like, um, I feel like early in my career, I was always like, I want to build everything. Like, literally, I am writing all the software to do all of the pieces of this pipeline because that's like, you know, it's got to be mine. And then as I, you know, have gotten older and as I've delivered, you know, however many projects. It's like, and the more well, you like to sleep. Yeah, right? <laughs> sleep is important. And also having support is important. Like working with companies who make great products and figuring out, I was calling myself middleware man for a while because I was writing so much middleware. And it was just like linking a bunch of different things together and developing workflows that are repeatable and deployable. And I think those are the shortcuts that you like learn to take. Um, in order to deliver things at the, the speed that you need to deliver them at. It's, it's not reinventing the wheel, right? It already exists. You don't need to make it again. It doesn't need to be a special sauce version of something that's out there that you can put in place. I, I completely agree. We, we do a lot of that, too. Although sometimes it is super fun to build your own custom render engine and see <laughs> beautiful graphics like, like larger than life. Don't reinvent the wheel until the wheel doesn't exist and you exactly. Or it falls off and you need falls off. One. Exactly. Thank you though, right? Flying We're the good? plane while building it, something yeah. to that effect. All the all the analogies. <laughs> so Thank thanks everybody. Really yes, appreciate the time. We'll be around. Uh, it's been great. Thank you everyone. Next talk.